بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحلى العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي We are back with another session of Quran analysis and today inshallah we are looking at the explanation of ayahs number 13 to 15 Last time we did ayah number 10 to 12 and so today inshallah we are progressing with that Just uh, maybe like a to recap because it's been a while just to recap what we discussed last time, we talked about, you know, mostly uh, ayah number 10 is the end of the discussion of the disbelievers. So Allah was addressing the disbelievers up to ayah number 10. And then, so ayah number 10 is basically the end of that. And then now the sort of like the focus is shifts to believers now. With the ayah number 11, ma asaba min musiba, now starts to talk to the believers all the way to the end of the surah so just to remind you again the way the surah is um, organized is it has three sections like major sections the first section is mostly about allah who he is uh his attributes and his names an introduction of who allah is and then you have a discourse about disbelievers allah is addressing the disbelievers and it ends at ayah number 10 and then ayah number 11 to the end is uh, a discourse or addressed to the believers okay so this is the section that we are in right now and it, it talked about ما أصاب من مصيبة إلا بإذن الله you know no cal calamity strikes except with the permission of Allah and we were commanded وأطيعوا الله وأطيعوا الرسول obey Allah and obey his messenger and if you turn away there's no harm done because at the end of the day the prophet's job is just to convey and we went into details about that so today we're gonna proceed to ayah number 13. Okay. So an ayah number 13 basically starts with Allahu la ilaha illahu. So that's where we are starting our discussion today. Um, this is ayah number. Sorry. Let me just get my notes ready. Okay. Allahu la ilaha illahu. So we just talked about wa Allah wa Rasul, and we discussed the idea of obedience as loyal obedience, the kind of obedience that you, you're subservient. You don't ask questions, like you just submit and devote yourself. It's out of love that you're doing. It's not because you're forced. It's because you love to obey Allah. That's the kind of pa'a uh, that we, we talked about last time. And what will make you understand what this ta'a is? Allah is saying, Allahu la ilaha illahu. Understanding the kalimatu shahada, la ilaha illa illallah, is basically the kalimatu shahada, is the the phrase of testimony. Like when somebody enters into Islam, they say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. Right? So this this phrase, this if you understand this phrase, then you would understand you would fall into the ta'a of Allah. Okay, you'd fall into the obedience of Allah. So this is what would inspire loyalty and obedience of Allah the fact that Allahu la ilaha illahu now when you look at this there's there's different ways of saying this Allah could have just said la ilaha illallah I mean that's the normal common phrase that we know la ilaha illallah there's no deity worthy of worship except Allah but when you look at this structure we have Allah in the beginning and then we have huwa in the end this this structure is starting with the name of Allah and it's ending with also, uh, a mention of him at the end. Like Allah is telling you, is drawing attention. Because now the musnad, the subject is Allah. The subject of discussion here is Allah. Allah is drawing special emphasis, extra emphasis to himself in this particular phrasing. Because you have the mubtada, which is a lafdul jalala, Allah. That's the mubtada. And then inside the khabar, he is also referenced. La ilaha illa huwa. So there's extra emphasis to to this statement that Allah is drawing uh into this to make to make us understand that we are actually talking about Allah here all right so um now let's dig a little bit deeper and we we mentioned last time uh where we get the idea when we were doing nahu and sarf we said you know we normally translate this phrase as there's no deity worthy of worship except Allah so where do we get the worthy of worship I explained to you where that word comes from because the khabar of la and nafiya lil jins is mahdhuf, is hidden. And that's where we get worthy of worship from. So we discussed that. Um, I'm not going to go through that again. Now, when you think about the word ilah 
and Ustad has talked about this word a lot in so many different lectures of his. And you probably are familiar with some of the ideas that he has mentioned, uh, the word Allah. So I'm not going to discuss all that. So I'm going to give you my basic uh, definition of this word. Basically what I came up with based on all the information that Ustad has given us on this word, ilah. So some say that this word comes from the grand name of Allah, where it, it, this is where the grand name Allah is drawn. Some say that. But it has a lot of several other meanings. For example, the most common meaning that we understand is that of true worship. So the, the idea of true worship. Okay. But also it suggests a source of refuge where you, you, you seek refuge. It suggests a, a, a source of contentment, peace, fulfillment, and the, the source of relief in times of desperation. When you're desperate, Allah is the one that you run to. It also suggests a concept of wonder, amazement, and complete awe in something. You're completely engrossed. You're completely just amazed by, by the, the object of uh, affection, basically. It also has the meaning of authority and obedience. Al-muta'a, the one who is uh, obeyed and the one who has authority. But the most interesting meaning is perhaps the meaning of utmost love like the the second most level of love above which you run mad if you love something more than that then you basically lose yourself so that is like the the most love you can have for something while you are sane while you are intact in your brains basically so it, it, it's really amazing so if you to put all this meanings together then you have uh, Allah becomes the one who is extremely and intensely adored and obeyed, loved and admired through the truest form of worship that leaves the worshipper in complete awe and amazement, thereby bringing about a sense of contentment and peace, uh, a fulfillment and peace. And the one who is sought after, uh, so the one who is sought, who refuge is sought in times of desperation. In other words, let me explain because that, that's just too much English. In other words, when you adore Allah so much, you love him so much that it forces you to obey him and you fall in devotion towards him. Like when he says you pray, pray, you pray. When he says wake up for Fajr, you wake up for Fajr. Because, not because you're being forced or anything, but because you love to obey him, because you love to worship him, because you love to devote yourself. And the more you learn about him, the more he, you just, you're amazed. You're completely just, in awe and you find tranquility in yourself in the middle of chaos you have peace in your heart and on top of that when you are in turmoil when you are in a state of calamity when you are in a state state of distress you run to allah and we see this uh, especially today uh, among the people of palestine we see this manifesting because these are people who've devoted themselves to allah they have loved Allah so much, they have worshipped Allah so much to the point that whatever they're going through right now, they're saying, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. They're saying, Alhamdulillah. They're saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilihi raja'un. They're saying, La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. That's the first thing they're saying. Like, they're going through such a difficulty, but the first thing they say is Allah because they understand who Allah is. They understand, La ilaha illa Allah. They understand the meaning of uh, Tawheed. Now, the culmination, this is the culmination of our understanding. When we understand who Allah is, this, first of all, okay, when you look at the entire surah, Allah has introduced himself before, didn't he? He told us a couple of things uh, before. So this, once you have gone through that journey, you understood, okay, uh, you know, Allah is lahul mulk wa lahul hamd. Allah is the owner of all authority and Allah is the owner of all hamd. And Allah is khalaqa samawati wal ard. He is the creator. And Allah is alimun bidati sudur. He is the one with the perfect knowledge. You understand this different aspect of who he is. Then now you understand that he should be worshipped and that there is no deity worthy of worship. Because once you've understand all that, this is basically the climax of understanding who Allah is. La ilaha illahu. As a result of all that, there is no deity worthy of worship other than Him. If you understand that lahul mulk, walahul hamd, khalaqa samawati wal ard, you understand all these different uh, ideas of and uh, names and attributes of who Allah is, then your understanding becomes la ilaha illahu. Why should I worship anything else? If 
all hamd belongs to Allah, if all authority belongs to Allah, if Allah is the one who is capable of all things, if Allah is the one who created all things, if Allah is the one who has perfect knowledge of all things and he knows my situation, then, and he's the one who is obeyed, you know, we just talked about obey Allah and obey the messenger. He's the one who's also obeyed and the word Allah also has meaning of obedience. And he's the one who is devoted. Then there's no, there's no deity worthy of worship other than him. This is the realization that a believer has. And when you have that understanding, then it's like you're taking your shahada afresh. It's like you're saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. It's like you're becoming a, a, a Muslim again. It's like you're renewing your faith. This statement gives you renewed energy and renewed faith in who Allah is. It renews your iman, which by the way, this entire surah is mostly about iman. Even, if, even when you look at the sections, you see that the first section, which is about Allah, is only four ayat. And then the second section is ayah number five to number ten. Then the last section, which is about Iman, which is about believers, even the, the about disbelievers, there's a bit of uh, Iman in there. So, but the last section about believers is the biggest section. Ayah number 11 to ayah number 18. So you realize this surah is about Iman. And this verse, this ayah here, Allahu la ilaha illahu, is the thing that is going to renew your Iman. Now that you understand all that has been said, then it's like you're taking your shahada again. And if you're and if you're taking your shahada anew, you're saying Allahu la ilaha illahu, you're coming to that realization, I'm like renewing my faith, then it's also like you're making a promise to Allah that, yeah, Allah, I am renewing my faith, and this is a promise to you that I will keep on uh nurturing this faith. I will keep on protecting this faith by just saying Allahu la ilaha illahu. This is a realization, an acceptance, and a promise to Allah that you will stay on the faith that you have chosen. Because again, this is being addressed to the believers. So once you have accepted this reality, you have renewed your faith and you're inadvertently, indirectly making a promise to Allah that you're going to try your level best to stay on this faith, this acknowledgement of faith that you just did. So Allahu la ilaha illahu wa ala Allahi mu'minun. You have ala Allahi. Now when we did this, we said ala Allahi is muqaddam. Now, the idea is we only rely upon Allah. Before, when we talked about obedience, we said, Obey Allah and obey the messenger. So when it comes to obedience, it's both Allah and the messenger. But when it comes to tawakkul, when it comes to the concept of tawakkul, it's only in Allah. And this concept of tawakkul is such a beautiful concept. And you will only understand this concept of tawakkul, how? Once you understand the la ilaha illahu, when you understand that there's no God worthy of worship other than Allah, then now you can completely and fully rely only to Allah. SubhanAllah, isn't that amazing? Like obedience leads to tawheed and tawheed leads to uh, tawakkul, the way the ayahs have been arranged. So obey Allah, obey the messenger. And if you have this kind of loyal obedience, that's going to lead you to pure monotheism. That's going to lead you to Tawheed, that's going to lead, lead you to understanding that there's no deity worthy of worship. And once you come to this realization and you affirm this idea, then what's going to happen? Then now you can rely on Allah. Now, uh, understanding tawakkul and what, what does it mean to have tawakkul in Allah? What does it mean to be to totally, completely rely on Allah? It has different meanings and we can draw different um, ideas from it. But I will tell you the meaning that... Um, what, what it means for me personally. And you can probably have your own ideas. I have so many different uh, analogies, but I'll just give you one. For me, tawakkul, I imagine myself standing at the edge of a cliff. Like I'm standing at the edge of a cliff and I look in front of me, there's a fire, there's a raging fire that is approaching me and it's about to get to me. And then I look at the bottom of the cliff it basically it's a bottomless pit i cannot even see the end of the pit, the the pit so i'm standing in front of me there's danger behind me there's danger all around me there's danger i basically don't have anywhere else to go and then i hear a voice coming from the bottom of the cliff saying jump i will catch you and to me tawakkul ala allah is to jump knowing trusting believing that Allah will cut you. Even if it means you end up dying. 
even if it means you end up dying, just that belief, that tawakkul, that reliance, that trust, that knowledge that Allah will be there for you is what I'm, I understand to be tawakkul for me. It is very scary at times. It feels impossible most of the times. You feel desperate. You feel hopeless. You feel completely lost. Like you cannot see the end of the time. You cannot see hope. You cannot see light. But you trust that Allah will make a way. And there's so many examples. And I'll give you a couple. Like for example, the story of Musa alayhi salam. He is standing in front of the sea. And behind him, Fir'aun and his enemy is fast approaching. They could see. And they're scared. Banu Israel are scared. And what do they say? Inna la mudrakun. We are definitely drowning. We are definitely going to drown. This is the end. This is it. Like we just came in the middle of the night. We escaped. But this is it. This is the end. That's the hopelessness that they had. That's the situation they, they were in. But what does Musa say? Alayhi salatu wasalam. He says, Kalla. No way. Absolutely no. N no way. Inna ma'ya rabbi. I have with me my Rabb. My Rabb is with me. He will guide me. SubhanAllah, I'm just, I'm just reading this ayah and I'm thinking, Sayyahideen, he will guide me. At that, po at that moment, what do you think when, when you're in that, that situation? Even if I will imagine you had that tawakkul like Musa and you're like, Inna ma'ya Rabbi. The dua that you, basically what you would say is like, my, uh, Allah is with me. He is going to annihilate them. A lightning bolt is going to come and is going to completely destroy them. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking if an enemy is fast approaching, yeah, Allah, deal with them. I mean, you can deal with me later, but deal with them fast. That's the danger that is fast approaching. But Musa doesn't say, Inna ma'ya Rabbi, he will take care of them. Like Allah is with me. He's going to destroy them. That's not what, Allah, what Musa is saying. Musa is saying, Allah is with me, he is going to guide me. As if he knows that Allah is going to make a way. He has so much tawakkul that he sees a way where there's no way. He doesn't even know what, what solution Allah is going to bring. He doesn't know. He's just saying, I know there's a solution. I don't know what it is. I don't know how it's going to come, but I know that it is coming. And guess what? Allah did, made the impossible possible. He parted the sea for Musa because of his tawakkul. He's standing there and the sea just starts, you know, pulling apart. Pulling apart and they're walking through, subhanAllah, because of the tawakkul of Musa alayhi salam. When you're in, in an impossible solution, when it feels like you cannot see the solution, that's the time you need to have tawakkul in Allah. You need to believe in Allah even if there's no solution. Another story probably is the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam is being thrown into a fire, into a raging fire that has been burning for three days and three nights. Massive fire that they had to build a catapult just to be able to throw, because they couldn't come close to it. It was so big. So they had to actually construct a mechanism to throw him in from afar because they couldn't go near it. That's how big, I mean, you can imagine, like, what were they thinking? Like, a small fire is not enough for this boy. They needed a massive but Jahannam, basically, to anyway, I don't know what they were thinking, but it's just it's just amazing that they went that overboard. Like tiny fire could not kill Ibrahim. Let's make this magnificent, amazing, huge fire. So they did. Anyway, they throw him in. At what point? I mean, Allah could have sent uh, the solution to Ibrahim at any point. He could have sent a bird to snatch him midair. This is uh, something that one of my sheikhs mentioned. He was like, Allah could have intervened at any one point. He could have sent a lightning to strike the catapult that they built. He could have sent rain to put out the fire, the massive fire. That He could have just intervened at any point. He could have just sent Jibreel with one wing and khalas, done. Like, there's so many different solutions if you think about the situation. But what solution did Allah give? Allah changed the nature of the fire. Allah allowed Ibrahim to be thrown into this raging massive fire. And then Ibrahim was just sitting there chilling, smiling. Yeah. They made the fire cool. Allah, made, Allah changed the nature of the fire because of Ibrahim's tawakkul. He wasn't worried. The guy is being thrown into a raging fire and he's just chill. The tawakkul that this boy had, this young boy had for Allah. 
and and he knew whilst being thrown into the fire that Allah will protect me. Allah will make a way out of this impossible situation. He'll find a way. And what did Allah do? He found a way into the impossible situation. He made the fire cool. He changed the nature of burning to something that you could actually touch and be safe in. Because fire is not something you're safe in. Something you, you thrown into a fire, you basically burn. And Allah changed that for Ibrahim. Why? Because of the tawakkul that he had. And there are so many stories. Let's go back to Musa alayhi salam. Musa sees a burning bush. He tells his family, listen up guys. It's at night. It's cold. Uh, maybe we're even lost. I see a fire there. I'm going to go there. Get some information. Get some direction. Maybe even get some fire so that we can stay warm and, you know, get some food going on or something. Yeah. So he goes. You know the story. He goes there. Allah tells him, uh, it's me, Allah. Remove your shoes. He removes the shoes. Goes into the presence of Allah. They have a conversation. Then Allah says, what's that? What's, what, what you got there, Musa? What is that? What is it that you have on your right hand? What do you have there? It's not that Allah doesn't know what he has. I mean, Allah, we just talked about the perfect knowledge of Allah. Allah knows. But he's making conversation. He's making Musa feel honored and comfortable and relaxed in the presence of Allah. SubhanAllah, how amazing is that? Anyway, that's not the point that I want to, to discuss. So Musa says, it's my stuff. I use it to do different things, this and that. They're having a conversation. And then out of nowhere, Allah says, throw it. Now, let's pause here for a second and just, Allah gives a command, throw it. We know what Musa did. But also we know what his people did. Banu Israel, they were given a command in Surah Baqarah. They were told, Izbahu Baqarah. Go slaughter a cow. A simple command. You would think that somebody with a brain in their head, they would just pick a cow and slaughter it. It's a simple command. No, not for the Banu Israel, no. It wasn't simple. They were like, ah, what do you mean a cow? What do you mean slaughter a cow? First of all, they were like, do we look like fools to you? Like, is this a joke to you? you a person just died and you, you want us to slaughter a cow? Like, what's the connection here? And then later on, they're like, okay, fine. What kind of a cow? These cows, they all look the same to us. I mean, it's all black, white, patchy, you know, it's all the same. And they all have a nose, they're all eating grass. They all, look, they all look the same. They're like, what cow? And they kept asking questions. Okay. And, and Musa is telling them, okay, this, this, this. And they're like, okay, fine. Tell us the color. I mean, we know this is the kind of cow you want us to know, but what is the color? Is it a red cow? Is it a white cow? Is it a black cow? Is it a yellow cow? What kind of a cow? I mean, at first, they were like, all these cows look the same. And now, all of a sudden, they can't tell them apart. They're so different. Subhanallah. Like, they just kept, kept asking silly questions and making it worse and making it worse and making it worse. And Allah made it even more difficult for them. But when it came to Musa, السلام, we learn a very stark difference between the personality of Musa and Banu Israel. We just see it clearly here. When Musa is being told, throw it down. He doesn't ask, yeah, Allah, do I throw it in front? Do I throw it in the back? Do I throw it from this distance? Do I throw it from my right side, my left side? Do I throw it at this speed, at that speed, at this? In none of those questions. Because it's a simple command, throw it. You just throw it. You just let it go. It's a simple command. You don't need to ask all these nonsense, uh, stupid, uh, silly questions. Anyway, that, that was a tangent. Now let's <laughs> get back to the story. So Musa throws it. And then what happens? It turns into a massive python. And it wasn't just a massive python that's just laying there. No, it's actually moving. Do you know how scary that is? You see a stick turn into a snake. And it's not just any snake. It's not like a tiny, you know, those slithering snakes that you can just, you know, flick away. No, it's a massive python. Some, something you've never seen before. And it's actually moving about. Like it looks like it's about to bite you. It's a very scary thing. And Musa was scared, as would anybody be scared in this situation. In fact, I would run away. And Musa was about to run away. That's how scary it was, okay? But then Allah tells him, listen, calm down, relax. You are in the presence of Allah. Uh, messengers are not afraid in my presence, Allah is saying. So, and then Allah gives another command. Grab it and don't be scared. G grab it? Imagine yourself in that situation. You, you, you're looking at this snake and it's moving about and it's massive and you're being told, grab it. I'm thinking, 
what do you mean grab it like should i just touch it does that qualify as grabbing like could i just hold the tail a little bit like those are the questions that are running in my mind i'm like yeah Allah, what do you mean grab it this is a, a massive snake but does musa ask again does musa ask any of those questions yeah Allah, can i grab it from the center can i grab it from the back what do you mean grab it can i just touch it can i pet it does that qualify as grab it none of those questions the tawakkul of Musa is being told, grab a massive moving snake, and he grabs it. Guys, he grabs it. I mean, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, how do you do that? The tawakkul of Allah. He is in the presence of Allah. Allah is telling him, do this. It looks like it's dangerous. But guess what? We will return it to its original form. Don't worry. Grab it, we will return it to its original form. And that's what tawakkul looks like, guys. It's scary. It's impossible sometimes. It looks like it's not a solution, but you just do it. And Allah makes out a way. Allah transformed it. Like, if you look at the ideas of tawakkul and the different stories where tawakkul is implemented in the seerah, wallahi, you would see miracles happening because of this simple concept of tawakkul. And you can only do this you can only have this kind of tawakkul if there's loyal obedience there. And that's why the concept of Allah wa ati'ul rasul was mentioned before. You can only have tawakkul if you have loyal obedience. Again, it's so amazing that Allah says, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ is used. Al-mu'minun is a noun. We know that. Ism, uh, ism fa'il. Yeah? Al-mu'minun. It's not... Alladina amanu, those who believed, or Alladina yu'minun, or those who believe. It's not a verb, it's a noun, and we know the difference between a noun and a verb. A verb keeps on changing, keeps on, there's tajaddud, keeps on renewing, but a noun is permanent, it's established, it's constant. So when Allah says, mu'minun, let the believers rely, these are the people whose faith have, has been established whose faith is constant, whose faith is continuous. It's not fluctuating. It's not wavering. These people who have this kind of belief, they're the ones who are going to show loyal obedience and they're the ones who are therefore going to rely completely and totally on Allah. They're the people who are going to have tawakkul. So it's a very unique niche group of people. May Allah make us among al-mu'minun, al-ladhina tawakkaloon ala Allah, those who rely and strictly rely on Allah. Amin ya Rabb. So then we go to the next ayah, uh, which is truly amazing because Allah just shifts from that idea. He goes to إِنَّمَا أَزْوَاجُكُمْ وَأَمْوَالُكُمْ عَدُوًا لَكُمْ Yeah, so Allah goes straight for إِنَّ مِنْ أَزْوَاجِكُمْ That's what إِنَّ مِنْ أَزْوَاجِكُمْ وَأَوْلَادِكُمْ عَدُوًا لَكُمْ Allah goes to certainly your spouses and among your spouses and your children are enemies to you. And I'm thinking, what? Wait, what? Enemies? Like, how? Your spouses and children are enemies to you? Now, remember the concept of taghabud we talked about. And remember the fun game, deal or no deal, I, I described to you, you know, where you have two boxes and you can swap. At the end of the game, you're actually allowed to swap the boxes, pick whichever one you want. Now, there's a part in the game I didn't tell you about where the host of the game basically allows you to call family or friends. So you can call your family and, and ask for their advice. You can be like, okay, so I have these two boxes remaining, box number, let's say box number five and box number 20. And I picked box number five, but I don't know whether to swap it with box number 20. So you can actually call your family and ask them, like, what do they think? Yeah. And they, they can advise you. But now the situation is the, the host gets some intel. Like, because he's the host, somebody tells him, listen, the box that this guy has is a losing box. There's nothing in there. It's pretty much garbage. There's nothing in there. Whatever he has, nothing. The box that the other person has is the winning box. They need to swap it. If they want to win, they need to swap it. So the host goes to this guy and tells him, listen, I'm telling you the truth. I need you to trust me. The box that you have is a losing box. The other box is the winning box. You need to swap. And then you call your spouses 
or your spouse and your children and they tell you nope don't 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 swap stay with that box if you love us if you care about us if you want to be with us if you want to come back home to us you better not swap that box we helped you pick that box and we know that that box is the winning box so you need to keep that box so that's what the family is telling you and this guy has information because he's the host of the show he knows and he's telling you listen you need to swap this box if if you if you know what's good for you so you're there and you're thinking uh i need to go back home you know if otherwise if i if i do this i'm not going back home i'm i'm dead meat so you decide not to swap the box and guess what fast forward on the day of, of on the day of ju- judgment your box is opened and guess what you have a losing box you lost big time now you're looking at your spouse like you you're the one who brought me here like you did this yeah so in that sense they actually i do want to come they are enemies to you because they stop you from you lost big they stop you from making an opportunity that could have given you a, a better alternative but then again still this this didn't sit w- well with me because the idea of adu an enemy in the quran is used for really bad people like the kinds of people that allah describes as an enemy to us it's really bad guys like it's iblis and shayateen and firaun and the mushrikun of makkah at the battlefield and the munafiqun like really bad guys so i was wondering like why would allah bundle that bundle up spouses and children with these really horrible guys it didn't sit well with me honestly i didn't like the idea of spouses and children being enemies maybe another word fine but then when you think about what an enemy is in a quranic text an enemy basically is the kind of person who gets you to obey them and as a result disobey allah they want you to obey them and disobey allah okay and in the other the other sense of it is that basically they use whatever resources they have whatever resources allah has given them to manipulate you to disobey allah and to cause harm whether to yourself or to others so they want to manipulate you to to do something against yourself or against others that's what an enemy does in the quranic context so basically what we are saying is that these your spouses or some of your spouses and some of your children are going to use their resources to manipulate you to cause harm to yourself or to others and in the process you're disobeying allah and you're obeying them that is what they're doing and so many examples uh have been given here and so many examples ustad actually talked about but before we go to those examples i want to explain something else you know when you let's let's take the example of murder murder is murder okay when you kill somebody is murder whether you kill a woman or you kill a man oh it's still called murder yeah but there are certain crimes of murder that are worse than others there are degrees like for example a serial killer somebody who has killed so many people is worse than a person who maybe killed somebody accidentally it's still within that fold of murder or maybe just hit and run for example yeah there's they actually in law there are different categories like there's manslaughter then i don't know there's um homicide i don't know what they, I, i don't know the names but there's certain different categories like that so you even in in adu in enmity there are different categories so you have shaitan and iblis and then at the end of the spectrum you have your wives and your your spouses and your children that are actually doing a similar type of thing so that's just an idea to give you an understanding of this word i do okay so now you can start to appreciate what allah is trying to say saying some of your spouses and children are actually blocking you they are stopping you from obeying allah by disobey uh, sorry from obeying allah by obeying them them so they want you to obey them and not obey allah and there's so many um stories you can even look at the story of yusuf alayhi salam like his own brothers tried to kill him in fact they decided oh killing him is such a such a big thing so let's 
let's just leave him for dead. Again, if you're leaving him for dead, he's going to die. So you, you might as well just kill him. It's like you killed him. There's no big difference. So you can see how the enmity is. Like it's, it's in degrees. Yeah. And then, of course, there's this min at tabi'idiya. Min at tabi'idiya. Let me see if I can be able to, to draw something here. Where's the... Um, uh, where is the... Okay. I thought I could be able to draw... Let's see. Can I be able? Hmm. Okay. Okay, I can't find that, so I'm just going to let's see if I can be able to to share my uh a different maybe like an open word thing. So new share. Um okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna explain the concept of oops. oh right okay okay I know what I wanted to do sorry hey guys I got um confused a bit for sure. For some reason, it won't do what I want it to do. Okay, so we just we just do this, and then we can go back. Anyway, um, so I wanted to explain the concept of min at idea. So min at idea. Basically, I'm gonna draw a nice. It's not really nice, but a cake, if you will. My cake is not the best, but. Yeah, so I want you to imagine that this is our cake. Okay, so it has these different parts to the cake. And when we say mean at the idea, basically is a mean that means apart from something from. So basically, if I take this portion out of this cake, and so now I have my portion out. Not the best artist. So this part that I took out, it's from this whole cake. So this is the whole and this is the part. So when you say min tab idea, this, this is from that, from the whole. So bad, bad is a part, a part of the whole or a part of the whole thing. Yeah. So that's the, the idea of min tab idea. So when you say inna min azwajikun, azwajikum wa awladikum, Mean here, it doesn't mean all the wives and all the spouses and all the, um, the, what what do you call it? the children? It only means some of them or a part of them. Okay, so that's something that we need to remember. Okay, now let's go back to understanding this. So that's just the idea of mean at idea here. Mean at idea. In the context of the eye. So it's not talking about all the spouses and all the children. It's min. And this is the mercy of Allah. Inna min azwajikum wa awladikum adu. So some are um, enemies to you. Okay. Now, remember when you talked about. Fa'aminu billahi wa rasulihi wa nuri ladhi anzalna. 
we, we mentioned believe when we're talking about the disbelievers, the context of disbelievers, Allah mentioned believe in Allah, believe in the messages and believe in the nur that you sent. So the Quran was described as nur. Yeah. So and the thing about nur is that when when people are in so much darkness, they can't handle the light. They can't see like it blinds them. It, it's, basically, they don't want the light. So you have some of your family members, some of your spouses and some of your children who are in so much darkness that when you bring a little bit of light, what do they do? They want to snatch it away. They want to put it out. They're like, ah, oh, you're hiding our eyes. Switch it off. Switch it off. We don't want to. We don't want the light. It's blinding us. This is what happens sadly in some Muslim families. You have somebody, a family that, you know, it's not practicing Islam. They, they're basically very modern and very, I don't know, stuff like that. And then out of nowhere, the daughter starts putting on hijab. They're like, huh? Have you become an extremist? Look at you. What are you trying to do? They try to yank the hijab. They try to belittle you. They try to, to do so many different things at you. Or the brother starts to pray. They're like, now you've become an extremist. You're basically following all these different things. And now, oh, here comes the ha haram police. Look at him with his patchy beard. He can't even grow a beard. Look at him. He's trying to grow a beard. Oh, now you're wearing the hijab. Oh, you're doing this. So, so they start doing such things like that. Well, what are they trying to do? They're trying to put out the fire in you. Like the, the light. They're trying to put out the light. And again, when we talked about Iman, what did we say the meaning of Iman is? Again, remember, this surah is all about Iman. And right now we are addressing believers. So we described Iman as something that you you safeguard, you protect, you keep safe and secure. Inside, deep, you protect it. You don't want anything to come to it. So you have belief in you. You have Iman with you. Don't allow other people, your family members, your spouses and your children to try and snatch this iman from you. And that is why Allah says, فَحْذَرُوهُمْ Be cautious of them. Be careful with them. Why? Because you have something so beautiful inside of you. You have iman. You have to guard it with your life. You cannot take any risk. You know, remember in like a bank, you, they normally have this big massive vault where they keep all the money and all the gems and all the jewelry and all that stuff. It's kept in a secure vault. You have Iman, you also have to keep it in a secure vault. You cannot allow your spouses to come in and just, you know, start poking holes into your Iman and start destroying it and start, you know, stealing some things. You can't allow that. فحذروهم. Be cautious of them. Be careful of them. You know, take necessary measures, take necessary precautions uh, with this and make sure that you guard what you have because what you have is precious. What you have is the most important risk that Allah would give you. So you have to be careful about it. And that's basically drawing boundaries. You're like, this is who I am. I am wearing hijab now. This I am praying five times a day. These are my boundaries. This is what I have decided to, with, to do with my life. You know, you set healthy boundaries and you inform your family. You said, this is what I would be doing, you know, and you cannot uh, snatch it away from me. You cannot take it away from me. This is uh, basically what I am about now. But then Allah continues. So فَحْذَرُوهُمْ is basically the command. Allah tells us what to do. In a situation where you have family members uh, that are causing you harm, either physically or emotionally or religiously or whatever, whatever harm they're causing you, you take precautions. That's the command. But then Allah goes on to suggest further measures like وَإِن تَعْفُوا وَتَسْفَحُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا and the way you would translate this is that, and if you forgive, and forgive, and forgive, then Allah is all forgiving. And you're like, what? What is going on? Why does Allah let you forgive, forgive, forgive three times? It's like, if somebody didn't know any Arabic, they'll be like, this this doesn't sound so eloquent. But like Ustaz says, إذا If several words, synonyms come together, there's more flavor to the meaning. Um, sad point again. Okay, let's see what uh, the word I do in the Quran. Is that what you mean? So I talked about the word I do in the Quran. You know, it comes in. Um, I think, or or is it? Remember, the Quran is light. I'm not so sure which point uh, you mean. So maybe you can explain that further. Okay. 
I do in the Quran, basically, like I mentioned, it comes in different contexts and it describes the worst kind of people. Like it describes shaitan. Take him as an enemy. Shaitan is an enemy to you, so take him as an enemy. And then it comes also in the context of Fir'aun, uh, when he was talking to Musa, Musa alayhi salam. And Fir'aun is described as an enemy. It comes in the context of uh, the battle of, I think, Badr, uh, where the Mushrikun of Makkah are described as enemies, like really, really terrible people. It also comes in the context of the Munafiqun. Yeah, so horrible people, really. And yet Allah is bundling up this really horrible bunch of people with your spouses and your children. And that confused me. I was like, why? So that's why I explained, you know, there's a there's degrees uh, to this enmity. Like you have the way murder, there's degrees to like different murders. Like there's murder that is manslaughter and then there's murder that is premeditated murder or something like that. So there are levels to that. So you have the worst level is shaitan, of course. And maybe, I don't know, the, the least level could be your spouses. But in any case, the act of adu, the act of being an enemy, is somebody who is actively using whatever they have to stop you from obeying Allah and to be able to harm yourself or harm others. This is what an enemy does. They take whatever resources they have and they try to stop you from obeying Allah. And as a result, you're harming yourself and you're harming others. So that's what an enemy does. That's what Iblis is doing. That's what Shaitan is doing. Shaitan is coming to you and whispering to you so that what? You can disobey Allah. So that you can stay away from Allah. And as a result, you're obeying him. And you're harming yourself. And you might even he might even whisper to you to harm others. Yeah? So in a similar way, your spouses and your children, they use their resources and they try to make you to disobey Allah. They try to use those to make... Uh, to make you obey them and disobey Allah and also harm them, harm yourself or harm other people in the process. So that's the idea of adu in the Quran and how Allah has used adu in, in different contexts in the Quran. Anyway, we were talking about forgiveness. So Allah goes a step further and says, وَإِن تَعْفُوا وَتَسْفَحُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Okay. وَإِيَّاكَ, وإياك جَزَاكَ اللَّهُ um, If you forgive and forgive and forgive, then Allah is most forgiving so this doesn't make sense so how do we understand again if synonyms come together there's a different flavor to each one of them like all of them they mean forgiveness but what flavor does ta'fu come with what flavor does tasfahu come with what flavor does tawfiru come with and that's what we we want to understand right now so ta'fu basically has the meaning of letting something go so you're not just forgiving you're forgiving you're letting it go and you're allowing them to grow, to become better through that act of letting go. So somebody does something to you, for example, maybe they, they come and, uh, I don't know, say some mean words about the way you practice Islam. And they're like, oh, look at you. You're practicing Islam now. You're waking up for Fajr and you're, you know, pretending to, all, to do all those things. You just let it go. And you hope that they will learn from their actions, they will learn from what their, their statements, and grow and become better out of it. So that's tafu. You let it go, and you give them time. Like, you don't really respond or do anything. You don't, yeah? You just give them time and let them grow out of it. Let them become better on their own. That is tafu. So you let it go, you erase it, and then you give them time to become better. And then tasfahu, which means which comes from safaha, which means a page. Basically, you're opening a new page. You're turning the page. And this has to do with forgetting, forgiving and forgetting. So this is tasfahu. You're forgiving and you're forgetting about it. You're not bringing it back in three months. Oh, remember what you did three months ago? Like, yeah. Or you're not even letting them feel the shame about it, their mistake. So they did a mistake. They learned from it. They grew out of it. And then three months later, you're like, hmm, yeah, I told you so. Or you just look at them in a certain way that they feel shame inside of them for doing that mistake. Allah is saying, don't even do that. Don't even give them the idea that they feel shame about it. Don't even bring it back. Like forgive and forget in the true sense of forgiving and forget. Because most of the, most of the time we say forgive and forget, but we don't really forget, do we? We're like, mm, it's, in, it's in my mind. I'm going to remember this for the rest of my life. No, Allah is saying, you open a new page. And when you open a new page, by, by the way, what do you do? You, you block the previous pages. Like you, when you flip a page, 
you cannot access basically you cannot see what is before so that's the idea of tasfahu you are covering what came before you don't want to see what came before it's gone yeah so that's the idea of tasfahu and then you have taghfiru now taghfiru is the idea of covering something but to cover to protect either to protect yourself or to protect others what does this mean in this context it means you don't go about telling people what your spouse did or you know what my spouse did you know what my children did to me last night you don't expose them you protect them that's the idea of taghfiru you're covering to protect them and to protect yourself so you don't announce their mistakes in public you don't you know go and like oh you know what my husband said the other day and you start gossiping and talking about you won't believe what he did none of that you forgive and you protect you forgive and protect which is really amazing different nuances with which allah told us to forgive just not forgive and give them space forgive and forget forgive and protect so these are the three different meanings of ta'fu tisfahu taghfiru truly truly amazing and of course when you do that what will allah do allah will forgive you and protect you at the same time so because uh, ghafara has the meaning of protection like mirfar is a helmet so you put it to cover your head but also protect your head because a helmet is a protective gear right it's protective wear so that's the idea of ghafur allah is going to forgive you is going to pardon yourself is going to cover all your sins and he's not going to bring it up subhanallah isn't that amazing because we sin a lot we have a lot of sins can you imagine if you sinned like 20 years ago and then somebody brought it up into public you you've changed you become a better person you and somebody brought it up how shameful that would be for you how devastating it would be allah is saying i will cover that sin up and i will not will not allow it to come up again i will protect you from it coming up again subhanallah isn't that amazing just by the name allah uh, al ghafur and then again the mercy of allah in this ayat when you look at the word choice of in allah chooses the word in ta'fu wa in basically in ta'fu wa tasfahu wa taghfiru so in is conditional we know that jumla sharqiyah it's a condition so it's not really you better forgive or you better ta'fu wa tasfahu it's not a command it's a it's a condition if you do this you get this so it's a choice basically you choose to do it or you don't choose to do it so he understands allah azza wa jalla that in certain situations your spouses or your children may have done something so horrible so terrible that you cannot just bring yourself to forgive them like you're not in that position so allah gives you a choice he says in ta'fu. if you do it then just know that allah would also do it will we'll forgive you like try to do it if it's too difficult then it's not a command allah is not forcing you because allah knows certain situations are just going to be so difficult and this is the mercy of allah subhanallah and another mercy um is that uh Allah is offering us the opportunity to choose. Just the fact that he uses a jumla shartia and not a command. It's not a command. He, he gives us an option. Choose to forgive. I mean, it's, it's if you understand what you, what you need, if you need Allah to forgive you and to protect you, then of, of course you're going to make this choice. You, if you're sensible enough, you will make this choice. That's the idea. But there's a mercy in that Allah did not say, wa'fu wa tasfahu wa taghfiru and instead he said wa in ta'fu wa tasfahu wa taghfiru it's a beautiful mercy uh, and when you just think about the mercy of allah by the way the concept of mercy is such a mind boggling concept you can even see mercy in the worst ayat like you're reading the quran and it's talking about judgment day and how you're going to burn in hell and some reason you would see allah's mercy in there like he would just say something and you would see allah's mercy the concept of mercy of allah's mercy and I'm using the word mercy, but of course, mercy is not synonymous with rahma. Rahma is a much richer word. And we know Ustad has talked about this if you've watched any of his lectures. So basically, the, the idea of mercy is truly, truly amazing. I encourage you guys to research more about the, the idea of mercy. Anyway, so that is what in ta'fu, wa tasfahu, wa tafiru, fa inna Allah ghafuru rahim. So that idea again of rahim, the, the mercy of Allah just coming up. Uh, twice the rahmah in this in this ayah subhanallah amazing then we talked about remember back when we said khalaqa samawati wal ard uh, wa sawwarakum fa ahsana suwarakum fa ahsana suwarakum he 
basically perfected or beautified you, uh, excelled in your beautification. We talked about the concept of beauty and how human beings were constantly drawn to beauty. We are all constantly looking to beauty, whether it's in physical beauty or inward beauty, morality, or just beautiful traits. Like you see somebody with beautiful akhlaq and you're like, oh, what a be what beautiful akhlaq. So that idea, where do we get that from? We get that from Allah. Allah is al-jameel. And Allah is essentially telling us, if you want beautiful traits, if you want Allah, who is the source of beauty, then you will attach yourself to these beautiful traits that I'm giving you. The, the, the beautiful traits of uh, afu and uh, uh, doing saf and doing um, uh, um, uh, basically. Yeah. So these concepts of forgiveness, you will attach yourself to these beautiful concepts because this is essentially the beautiful trait of Allah as well. Allah is al-Ghafoor. Allah is al-Afu. These are some of the traits of Allah, which are beautiful traits. We call them Asma'ullah al-Husna. Al-Husna, beautiful. Yeah, the best, basically, the most beautiful uh, of names. So if you're looking for beauty, attach yourself to the beautiful traits of Allah. Do be, be as close to the traits of Allah as possible. Then you would find the the beauty and the source of beauty that you, you're seeking or you're looking for. Anyway, uh, there's a slight um, indication that Ustad mentions about the beautiful balance between be cautious of them, be firm in your decision, draw boundaries, set your boundaries clear, and like when you hear it's a command and it's very firm and you have to be principled. But then when you hear وَإِن تَعْفُوا وَتَسْفَحُوا It's more lenient. So Allah is drawing a balance between being firm, being principled, and also how to deal with people being kind and being nice. So in Islam, we are a balanced people. We're not an extreme. We're not just firm. We're like, ha, I pray five times a day. You're not going to tell me anything. You're going to Jahannam. We're not just firm. But the way we also deal with people is kindness. Is there's a there's leniency, there's sweetness that we deal with people. So it's a balance between both ihdaruhum wa in ta'afu wa tisfahu wa tafiru. So it's a beautiful balance, and you can watch the Ustaz lecture to, to get more uh, information on that. Anyway, so remember when last no, not last week, the other week we discussed um the disbelievers and we said uh nar khalidina fiha wa al so that was the ayah number 10 was the end basically of discussion about disbelievers. And they, their punishment basically was the fire of Jahannam. For these disbelievers, they were com loyal companions, loving companions of the fire. That's what the ayah says. But the, the believers, Allah is telling us, look, for the believers, you get the fire of, of, of wealth and children. fitna. Certainly, your, children, your wealth and your children are a fitna for you, which is an interesting one. Because what is fitna? Fitna is basically purification by fire. That's what fitna is. You're getting purified by fire. So the, the, the disbelievers are getting purified by the actual fire, while their believers are getting purified by their wealth and their children. So when you think about it, uh, when I was trying to think about this eye, to be honest, I don't have kids. I don't have a lot of money either. So this this ayah was hard to do to the on because I couldn't relate. I was like, okay. Mm, I have neither. So how do I understand this ayah? But then I asked myself, what is the common thing about this two? What is the one thing that, you know, like is common between these two? And then I realized that we spend a lot of time with children and we spend a lot of time trying to make money. We spend most of our lives making money so that we can raise children. And then we spend the other rest of our lives raising children so that they can make money. SubhanAllah. It's like an endless cycle of money, children, children, money, money, children, children, money. And it just keeps on going and going. It's money, children. All the time we have, half of it is making money. Half of it is raising children. And then when they're grown up, they do the same thing. They make money, they raise children. Make money, it's endless cycle. And that's the much we spend our time with. And subhanAllah, Allah is telling us, if you're going to spend your entire lives basically in these two things, then you're bound to have some impurities. These things are going to give you some impurities. Like along the way, you'll be too attached 
to money and you'll be too attached to children that normal purification is not going to be enough. Like you need to re really be put in a serious test so that you can actually burn these impurities away. You know how they purify gold? You burn it until all the impurities evaporate and then you have pure gold. So basically, we are going to be burned with the test of children and the test of money until all the impurities, all the, the deep things that came as a result that you know attached themselves so deep, they can evaporate so that we can be purified. Again, the idea is not just to test us for the sake of testing us. The idea is basically what the ayah uh, says at the end, and that is, Wallahu um, indahu uh, ajrun azim. And uh, Allah basically, Wallahu uh, indahu ajrun azim. And to Allah, Allah has the most, the, the greatest uh, reward. So the idea is not just to test us for the sake for the sake of testing us. Allah wants us wants to reward us. Allah wants to give us the, the best reward, essentially, yeah. So money and children are, in fact, a form of investment. We invest time into these two things. So we expect some reward at the end of the day. Some people hope that at the end of making so much money, they'll be happy. That, was, that is their expected return on investment. I'm going to make so much money so that I become happy. That's their idea. And other people think I'm going to have so many kids and at the end of the day, they're going to help me in my old age or they're going to, you know, make money for me or they're going to help me in some way. Like you just don't like there's some hidden expectation with kids, with children and with money. That's the idea. But Allah is telling you, I'm going to test you with these two things until you, re you realize that re the return on investment is not what you think. It's with Allah. The ajr, the payment, it's with Allah. OK, so the greatest return on investment is going to be with Allah. Allah has the greatest reward. Subhanallah. Now, um, let me just share some contrasting. When I was I was reading Surah Saba, let's see, reading Surah Saba here, and there was a, an interesting rela relationship where money and children were mentioned. And I just wanted to share with you. Okay, so this is what the kafirun is saying. So, we did not send a message, uh, uh, a warner to a village or a, a people or a town, except that the, um, the leaders, basically, or the elite would say, uh, we are certainly disbelievers of what you have been sent with. We, we don't, we deny, we reject whatever you've been sent with. Okay. And then the next ayah, which is the ayah that I wanted to share with you. So this is the elite they're saying. They said, we have more kids and more wealth. We're never going to be punished. I mean, have you looked at us? We're the elite. We have so much money. We have so many kids. We are basically creme de la creme, you know. We cannot be punished because we have amwal and awlad. Subhanallah. And Allah in Surah Tahabun, what is he saying? It's a test. Don't you see? You're going to be punished if you don't realize that it's a test. Subhanallah. Um, and then Allah says, Allah extends risk to whoever he wants. And he apportions it. And certainly most people don't know this. And certainly, this is what I want to share with you. It is certainly, it's not your wealth or your children that's going to bring close, you closer to us. It's not the fact that you have so many kids or you have so much money that brings you closer to Allah. That's not the criteria here. Again, remember, your money and your wealth and your children is a test from us. So just because you have so much of it, doesn't mean you're closer to Allah. Oh, Allah loves me so much. He gave me so many kids. Oh, Allah loves me so much. He gave me... Can't you see all this wealth he has given? Well, Fir'aun basically had so much. And you think, did, did his wealth bring him closer to Allah? Of course not. That's not the criteria here. Allah is saying it's not your wealth or your children that bring you closer to us. But those who believe and do good. إِلَّا مَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا Again, mentioned in Surah Taghabun, وَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ it's mentioned there uh, in the previous ayat. 
whoever does, whoever believes in Allah and does good. This is the criteria. Believe and doing good and having these virtues, the virtues that we have we've started discussing now, you know, like the virtues of forgiveness, the virtues of obedience. These are the virtues that Allah is talking about. These are the good deeds that you need to be doing. Believe and doing good. Those are the guys who will have a multiplied reward for what they did. And they will be uh, secure. They will be safe. You cannot feel safe with your money and your children. Don't for a second think that because you have so much money, then you're safe. You're not safe. Just because you think you have so many children and you have, you think like they will protect you from other people. Don't for a second think you're safe. You're not safe. The ones who are actually safe are the ones who are going to be fil ghurfat. They're going to be this in elevated mansions. In this, uh, in Jannah. That's where you're going to be safe. But here, just because you think you have so many kids and you have so many, uh, so much wealth, don't feel safe in that. Innama amwalukum wa awladukum fitna. It is nothing but... Um, Fitna to you. Subhanallah. Oh, sorry. I forgot to. I didn't change the, the slide. Oh, my God. I'm sorry, guys. We're almost done and I forgot to change the slide. Anyway. Uh, so that's the idea. So lastly, uh, before we go into next week's class, we, we are, we, this is the last slide we're going to do. I just wanted to share with you this. Basically, it's my only jihad. had. It could be wrong. You don't have to agree with me, honestly. It's just that I, I, this came to me and I thought, I'm going to share it. Okay, again. So when you look at, when Allah started discussing the believer, uh, the discussion of, for the believers, he said, Ma min musibatin illa bi'ithnillah. Calamities are by the permission of Allah. Okay. So it, it's like when he, he was addressing the believers, he was like, because as a result of your belief, you're going to have some challenges come your way. Your belief, it's not just going to be smooth sailing. Okay, now you've believed now. Yay! Not going to be smooth sailing. There are challenges that are going to come your way. The first challenge is that calamities are going to strike you. You should anticipate calamities. And these calamities, by the way, are bi'ithnillah. It's because Allah allowed them. And we talked about this. And subhanAllah, the amazing thing is that Allah did not just say, tell us, okay, calamities are going to come your way. Deal with it. I'm not going to, I don't care. No. Allah gave us solutions. Allah told us what we can try and do. So solution number one, he says, remain steadfast in belief. Uh, Allah will guide him. So believe, continue to believe. Be steadfast in your iman. And then Allah wa Rasul. Obey Allah and obey his messenger. Then Allah la ilaha illa hu. Reaffirm your tawheed. Reaffirm your um, iman. And then when you basically when you're in calamities, this is what I, I imagine the solutions are. And then, of course, let the believers have total reliance in Allah. Whatever is happening to you, this is the solution. This is what you need to fix. Your, you need to make sure that you imagine. Because calamity is not something that you can just basically do away. Like, if Allah um, writes for you a calamity, if Allah allows for, you, for a calamity to, to strike you, you just have to wait until it goes away. Like there's nothing much you can do. So the solution is basically to just work on your iman, on your internal things. You basically remain steadfast in your iman. You obey Allah. You do what, your salawat. You do what you need to do. You b basically remind yourself what la ilaha illallah means. You keep on remaining steadfast in your belief. And you do tawakkul. Just like Musa did, alayhi salam. Just like Ibrahim did. Just like all these different pro prophets did in the face of calamities. Have total reliance in Allah. And then you have challenge number two. Inna min azwajikum awladikum aduwan lakum. Your spouses and your children are going to be enemies to you. And by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I'm saying spouses because azwaj, zawj, means both male and, uh, and female. So I know some translation says wives. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think zawj is both male and female. And it's used like that in the Quran as well, referring to both male and female. So that's why I'm saying spouses. I'm not saying wives and I'm not saying husband. I'm saying spouses, okay? So to cater for both male and female. Anyway, so your spouses and your children are enemies. So what are you going to do? Solution number one, احضروهم. Be aware of them. Be cautious. Take, take necessary steps. Be protective of your own iman. Take precaution. But solution number two, pardon, overlook, forgive. Wa'afu, wa'asfahu, wa'afiru. Subhanallah, for every single challenge, 
Allah doesn't just give us one solution. He gives us more than one solution. Isn't that amazing? The rahmah again of Allah is just like, okay, this is the solution, that's it. No, he gives us extra. He gives us more. And we will talk about this when we probably do the last ayat. And then the last one is, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ fitna. Your wealth and your children are a test for you. So what do we do? It's going to come next week. Have taqwa. Fattaqu. Wasma'u. Wa'ati'u. Wa'anfiqu. And give charity. So have taqwa. Listen. Obey. Give charity. You know, do all these things. Your wealth, give charity, is basically one of the, the, the solutions to. If you have a problem with wealth, like if wealth is a fitna for you, you need to start giving it away. That's, a lot, that's what Allah is saying. Give it away. If you're spending too much time with your children and they're starting to affect you, you have these parents who are helicopter parents. They're constantly just hovering above their children. They want, don't want to let them go. Allah says, let it go. Let it go. Let them go. You know, listen and have taqwa of Allah, basically. And then, of course, the second solution is give Allah a goodly loan or a good loan. Lend Allah, subhanAllah. And that ayah is just going to be so powerful, inshallah, when we discuss it. And that will be the end of this section. Of course, we touched this. Um, these solutions are part of the next ayah that we're going to see. So we basically just introduced that a little bit. So, sorry. Um, yeah. And that brings us to the end of our discussion. I don't know if there are any comments or questions or anything else to that. Uh, but that's the end, inshallah. Next week, we would look at ayah number 16 to number 18. We would do the nahu and sarf. And then the other week, we would do the explanation. Maybe two more weeks, uh, three more weeks remaining because I want, we will have an extra week at the end just to tie everything together and discuss about the thematic um, structure, the different structures of the ayah that I could come up with. And then just to wind up and conclude the ayah in a nice, in a nice way, inshallah. So the last session probably will be a very short one, inshallah. So about three more sessions remaining, but then we'll be done with Surah Al-Abun. It's been a, an amazing journey with all of you. I don't know if there's any questions or any anything else that maybe came to your mind um, while you were thinking about this ayat. Okay. Um, looks like we're all good. Alhamdulillah. We'll end there. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka. Wa natubu ilayk. Salaamu alaikum guys. Wa alaikum salam.